our first speaker is Ben Diggles. Oh, uh, thanks very much. Um, my talk's not quite up here yet. Uh, my job, main job at the moment is to stop you all from falling asleep after lunch. So I'll see if I can do my best. So my talk today is uh, on uh, a project that I did examining the effects of, uh, of fish attractants on the hooking location of some uh, reef fish on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, on the soft plastics and hard-bodied lures. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce my co-authors, the, uh, the bloke uh, standing up here, uh, Stephen Wesh from Brisbane, uh, Ingo Ernst from Canberra, um, uh, and Katie Scutt, uh, also from Canberra, and our uh, research location here is Heron Island, it's on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, uh, we're down here in Melbourne. I come from Brisbane here. I think it's 1,000, 1,500 k's north. Great Barrier Reef is up here along the east coast of Australia, and Heron Island is in the southern section of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, just so you know where we're operating. At Heron Reef, uh, it's actually it's a very small island and a large reef platform. It's a platform reef. We're about 23 degrees south. The island has a resort and a research station, which is, uh, is fondly used by all of us uh, uh, researchers into that, um, into reef fish and uh, studying coral reef ecology. It's around 40 miles offshore, 65 k's. And the main features uh, that are relevant to this talk is we have a reef flat area, which is usually around two metres deep at high tide. Uh, the reef edges, uh, where the water flows off um, you know, on the tide drop. Uh, and this lagoon area, which we do operate in sometimes when we're doing this kind of work. Uh, then the whole surface area of that reef is around 30 square kilometres. So it's actually not a bad little research area, uh, laboratory. Quite a pleasant place to work. Now the background of this work is uh, we, um, myself and some of my co-authors co did uh, a study, one of Australia's first hooking mortality studies back in 1996 where we examine the hooking mortality of two species, uh, reef fish species that are found in those shallow reef flat waters. First species is Lejanid, it's the stripy, Lejanus carpinatatus. Uh, and the second species is a Ceranid, it's a wire netting cod, Epinephilus coianus. Uh, now that study was actually published back in 1997. Uh, in marine freshwater research. But essentially that study was related to, we wanted to examine the difference between using lures and bait uh, and uh, different types of hooks on the, uh, the survival rate and the hooking locations of these two species. So the bait we were using were tuna chunks on, a, on single barbed or barbless hooks, which are mustad double seven, double sixes, which are these hooks here. The lures that we used at that stage were these are uh, the reliable uh, seven centimetre Nils Master Invincibles, and we equipped them with either barbed or barbless treble or single hooks. So when we were using the singles, again, we replicated what we were using with the bait. And overall, back then, uh, the overall mortality rate that we got was very low. Uh, we, we did uh, several hundred fish of each species. 1.7%, uh, which was quite encouraging, as is again no shallow water, so no barotrauma involved. Uh, when we delved into that result a bit, uh, you know, a bit more closely, we found that the higher mortality rates were were occurring with bait, 5% uh, versus lures, which was uh, less than 1% mortality. And the other upshots of that um, project was the barbless hooks uh, and single hooks. Both were quite effective. At, uh, reducing your handling time, you know, getting those fish sort of uh, turned around and back into the water more quickly. So these are quite classical, I guess, uh, hooking uh, mortality study results, but this was one of the first times it's being done in Australia. So back then we were able to monitor all our fish for at least 48 hours and some of them for sev uh, several more days post-capture. So we'd uh, capture the fish and then we'd transport them back to the, to the uh, research station, hold them in a large land-based tank, and monitor them. So anything, any fish that died, we, uh, we examined, uh, you know, we did a post-mortem on them to actually work out what the cause of death was. And what we did find back then was all mortalities occurred within the first 24 hours. So, so every fish that died, it occurred in the you know, 12 to 24 hours, and they were almost, well, universally due to deep hooking. So we were damaging the vital organs. 
So the gills, heart and pericardia. And here's a dissection of one of the, the stripy snapper with uh, large hemorrhages here in the pericardium area where a hook had actually penetrated and caused that mortality. So these are acute uh, forms of death caused by, by hook injury. Um, and the other interesting thing that we found is we did cut some of the deep hooked fish which we, we would have killed if we'd uh, tried to take the hooks out. We left the hooks in there. And lo and behold, those fish, within 48 hours, all the hooks, they got rid of all the hooks, we were finding them on the bottom of the tanks. So that was that uh, original study. However, time moves on, and that's, it was over 25 years ago uh, that we did that. And tackle changes. Fishing tackle changes. In, in this country, we had a huge soft plastic revolution around the early 2000s. So, uh, I mean, uh, previously, uh, your tackle boxes back in the day would be mainly covered you know, with hard-bodied lures. But nowadays, in a modern tackle box, we're seeing large numbers of soft plastics, these gulps, which are a scented soft plastic, and these other fish attractants that were being developed uh, by the industry as the industry, uh, the wreck fishing industry, tackle industries, uh, developing. And I always thought, uh, what, you know, what are the effects of these tackle uh, innovations on, on our original study? Would they actually be changing uh, what we were seeing uh, back in the day with the uh, hooking locations and the mortality rates? So that was actually the, the concept of this current study that I'm here to talk to about. Now, the other thing to remember is back uh, at Heron Island, they had a fire in 2007 at that research station. So we didn't even have an observation tank available anymore. So we couldn't exactly replicate the study. And so we, in this study, we relied solely on hooking location as a proxy for mortality risk. Because we do know if fish get hooked deeper into vital organs, it's, uh, it's, it increases their risk. So again, with the bait, we used the same bait uh, as we did in the original study. But this time, we included a circle hook uh, replicate, and that's the, uh, the number of the, the, the circle hook. So we tried to maintain the gap, hook gap, be fairly similar to the, the old tarpon hooks that we used originally. And the lures, we, we had the trusty old Nils Masters. One of the main reasons we used that originally is you could get it anywhere in the world, and fortunately they were still available. But we compared them to this modern uh, soft plastic, which we actually used a squidgy flick bait. All the hooks in this study were single barbless hooks, because Based on our original research, that's actually the most fish-friendly way to do it. And uh, after a while, when you're de-hooking hundreds and hundreds of fish, you just can't... You hate trebles and you hate barbs. And that's sort of how, how this comes down. So single barbless hooks are easier on fish. And the other uh, treatment that we used, we tried each of these with and without a, a commercially available fish attractant. The one we use is guzzle goop. It's also marketed in Australia as uh, squidge factor, uh, uh, squidgy S-factor. And I have to say, like, that was something that I, I developed with Shimano uh, over 10 years ago. So it's a commercially available attractant. Now, as I said, we're using hooking location as a proxy for mortality risk. So to attain that, uh, we rank deeper hooking locations with a higher hooking score. So if we look down here, uh, we used a linear scale. We just rated them 1 to 10, categorised the different places. So uh, the peripheral foul hooking uh, was, was lower scores. And the further, the deeper that you went down into the throat and the gut, where we gave it a higher score. And by doing this, we also allowed us to uh, compare with our 1996 data. So we could actually go back, we had all the original data sets, and we could go just do the whole thing again and do a comparison of what this new modern tackle is doing. And so then we went out into the laboratory. So that's what our laboratory would look like on a good day. It's a bit hard to handle, but someone has to do it. So uh, what I'm showing here is the combined results for both stripies and wire netting cod. We go out and there's plenty of these on the reef flat, so 150 of each. What we actually found, what we have here is a, a graph. We found a stronger trend of deeper hooking uh, with the different treatments. So what we have here is the mean hooking location on this, this axis. And on this axis, we actually have the different treatments. So HB stands for hard-bodied lure. HB plus A, hard body plus attractant, soft plastic, soft plastic plus attractant, uh, bait with a circle hook, and bait with a J hook. So they're the different treatments. These are average hooking locations. And immediately you can see here uh, quite a strong trend uh, with deeper hooking when you move from hard bodied lures to soft plastic lures and then to bait. Now the other really interesting thing here was adding the attractant onto the lures 
increase the mean depth of hooking. So for hard bodies, we see this jump up from here to here. Soft plastics, again, from there to there. Um, deepest hooking was still with the bait treatments, treatments five and six, but again, we saw something that pops up quite often in these hooking mortality studies is that circle hook uh, was hooking uh, generally a bit shallower. The, the J hooks were the ones that were hooking the fish deepest. So when we tease those, uh, that uh, information out a little bit more and looked at the individual fish species, uh, we said, so the, the general trend was still there, but uh, each fish species shows slightly different behaviour. So this is the wire netting cod, this is a serranid. Uh, as you can see here, we get the uh, increase in hooking depth with the hard body. But look, there's a huge jump up with the soft plastics. Uh, and especially if you added the attractant to the soft plastics, you're actually averaging hooking them deeper than with bait on circle hook. Um, so that's uh, this red arrow here shows you exactly this big jump up once you put the attractant on the soft, uh, soft plastic. Now, um, with the wine, uh, stripies, this legenid actually looks slightly different in that we're not seeing this big jump up with the soft plastics. However, with the hard bodies, uh, this really big improvement or, or increase in, in hooking depth, and we put that down to them probably being, um, they're just swiping at these hard bodies without the attractant, but as soon as you added an attractant, they went from just trying to maybe scare it away from wherever they were to actually trying to eat it. But that general trend of, of uh, remained consistent between both species. Now the other thing that we could look at is, uh, is temporal change. Uh, we did these two studies 20 years apart. However, one of the treatments, uh, you know, our treatment one in this current study was identical to treatment four in 1996, and that's your Nils Master with a single hook, single barbless hook. So we could go back and look at that original data set, and there's an opportunity to examine whether both of these species of fish attacked hard-bodied lures without attractant on a, on a barbless hook between 20, 20 years apart. Was there going to be any difference? And when we actually did, uh, did the studies, uh, all of these, we've written this paper up, I'll talk about it at the end, but all of these differences were actually statistically significant. However, when we looked at the temporal change, no difference whatsoever. The data sets were basically identical. So that showed the fish behaviour attacking these lures had remained unchanged in that 20 year period. That may in part be due with the fact that we are working in a, um, a research zone which doesn't actually get uh, recreational fishing, uh, much recreational fishing pressure at all. However, in uh, summary, that's not a bad day out there, is it? Uh, it's making me want to go back there. Uh, soft plastics resulted in deeper hooking than hard-bodied lures. Use of an effective fish attractant changed fish behaviour and resulted in deeper hooking on both hard-bodied and soft plastic lures. No change in fish behaviour to non-centred hard-bodied lures in 20 years. And therefore, the conclusion for this is soft plastics with attractants could potentially increase your post-release mortality and your fishing power. And um, that is something that we've actually written up uh, in, the, in the literature. Uh, there's a couple other lessons when you're operating on the reef flat in these areas. Uh, and we were given plenty of lessons by uh, some of the bycatch. And one of these uh, species is Spangled Emperor. Uh, some of the earlier reports from early explorers labelled them as 14 pounders. And what we find is in these areas, yes, they actually grow to about 14 pounds. And you see what they do to your tackle when you're trying to work on these other, these other fish. Uh, fishing reels as well, burning out the drags, especially in the modern, modern uh, reel. A, two -year, you know, a brand new 2016 reel lasting two days out there, while some of the older reels that we use, same manufacturer, actually lasted a decade. It might actually say something about changes in fishing tackle manufacturing over the past decade as well. And the other thing that we noted uh, just brief, just in passing was what we termed surrounded pigment abnormality syndrome. Now it's actually this manky looking uh, pigment issue that we see here it's on this wire netting cod. Now we'd never seen this before. I've done a lot of work up in that environment back in the 90s. We'd never seen anything like this. This is the first fish that we actually saw. We took photographs of it, it's very unusual. Uh, back in 2012, and that, the prevalence at that time was 2%. At the same time, uh, the sunburn was being uh, reported in other surrounded species nearby, coral trout, which was quite interesting, but this is the first time this had been reported in wild netting cod. But when we ba went back in 2016, the prevalence was up 
three times higher, 6%. Then 2017, we're actually finding 17% of these cod with these same lesions. We actually don't know what it is, what the cause is, but it's some sort of interesting pathology. That's, a, that's the, uh, the, the other surrounded, the, um, uh, the coral trout with it. So it's something that we've written up. I think it's something that maybe uh, it needs more investigation because we really don't know what it is. But in the end, I'd like to uh, thank you all. I hope you found that entertaining. Uh, thanks to the, the research station and our, um, and our assistance, but also we should be thanking the fish. Uh, some were par willing participants and, and probably others weren't. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ben. That was very informative. I'd really like to be one of your research assistants in the future, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> especially if you're going to places like that. OK, so we'll keep moving. Um, I've just been advised that we've, our last two spots now are going to be free, so we'll have plenty of time for question and answer um, following the, uh, the, the next two. So we'll jump straight into it. Here's Luke from Canada. Yeah, so the talk I'm going to talk about today is mostly looking at the technology that we use to monitor the post-release behavior of freshwater fish. Um, and so I'd like to start by thanking uh, the people that I work with and the people that have sponsored this, or funded this work that uh, I do out there. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, fisheries in Canada. Um, there's various motivations for these fisheries. Um, they range from leisure activities to competition to people catching fish for food. They also provide large economic benefits through competition, brings local people, or uh, brings people to local, small local areas. Um, you know, it gives money to accommodations and local restaurants and tackle shops. Uh, it happens year round, and uh, from plus 30 degrees to negative 30 degrees, and these fish could be harvested or released. Um, so catch and release is simply just returning the fish to the water. This could be due to mandatory reasons or voluntary reasons. Things that might make someone release fish mandatory um, is to follow regulations within slot sizes, uh, close seasons, or if they reach possession limits. Um, on average, there's about 80% of the fish are released in Canadian waters, and some of these fisheries can reach up to 100%. And it's generally thought that fish release survive this interaction. Um, but we do know that there is such things that we can do, or there is things that might influence this, such as uh, the fight time, which can lead to excessive exhaustion, uh, the handling time, which is anything where the fish is removed from its natural environment. Um, that could be spending time in a net, um, time during an unhooking period, or even placed in a live well. And um, we also know that injury is one of the leading causes of mortality. Uh, so this could be deep hooking in the gills, uh, in the gullet, and anglers have the opportunity to either cut the hook, cut the line, or try and remove that hook. And one of the most challenging parts of the, the angling interaction for fish is that air exposure, which often happens when fish are measured or taken pictures of. And so the main focus of my stuff is looking at, uh, you know, what do fish do once they're released, and how do these different angling practices or handling practices influence that uh, the post-release post -release behavior of fish and the fate of the fish once they're released. And mostly looking at uh, how much the fish move, uh, so the locomotor activity and the, the ODBA is going to come up enough, and that's uh, just talk, it's the overall dynamic body acceleration. Also looking at water temperature and depth selection of these fish. And to do so, um, we use these biologgers, um, and these biologgers store data internally. Um, they record the acceleration uh, the water temperature and the depth of fish. And then we used various methods to attach these to the fish. So the first method um, we started out with is using a Velcro strap that goes around the fish, where the, on the Velcro strap you have uh, the biologger, and the, bio, the strap is attached to a line to a fishing rod, and uh, you have a predetermined monitoring, pre uh, monitoring period. And then these things are also fairly easy to retrieve and you're almost always getting that biologger back at the end of that monitoring period. So after you sit on the water for a long time, letting fish swim on a line, you start thinking about a different technique to, to try and monitor this behavior. And so we came up with this method 
Um, that's a pop-off tag. And in fresh water, we don't really have the luxury of having galvanized release clips. So you gotta find a different way to actually let these tags pop off the fish. And so this first method came up with is uh, using a small candy that dissolves after X amount of time and pops off and floats to the surface. And then in that, you have a radio tag which can help you find that. Um, for this, you don't really have a, a predetermined monitoring period. It's whatever the tag's gonna allow you to do. Um, there's a high fail rate with this method and the retrieval can be rather difficult for this. So after having a bunch of fail rate with this, I started thinking of a different method to use. And so we found that we could use cat gut sutures for this. Um, and so it's a similar package that we use with a, a radio tag and the bio logger. Um, but instead we have this, the cat gut suture and we get a little bit of a longer monitoring period. And as you can imagine, the retrieval could be difficult when this tag pops off and starts floating across uh, some of the lakes. So using these bio loggers, we can see what the fish are doing, where they're going, how much they're swimming, the orientation of the fish. Um, and so some of the applications of these are um, to see, so in Canada we have um, different seasons and, and the one season that's half the year is an ice fishing season. And so all the lakes are frozen over and you go out onto this slab of ice and you make these holes and it could be minus 30 and you catch a fish and now you have to unhook this fish and maybe it's a trophy fish and you want to take a picture with it and now this fish is now exposed to the elements, the wind, um, the sub-freezing temperatures. And so we we're interested to see how this air exposure and ice exposure period influence that post-release behavior of these fish. And so what we did is we angled for largemouth bass, um, we attached the, a Velcro strap with the biologger to them, and then we air expose them or ice expose them for uh, 30 seconds or 90 seconds, and then we also had a control where the fish was not um, air exposed at all. We measured the wind speed and the wind chill, we look at the skin temperature, and then we release them for a nine minute period. Not surprisingly, we found that, uh, you know, fish that were put in the cold became colder, and the longer they're exposed to the cold temperatures, the colder they became. And so what this meant for the temperature is that, or what this meant for the post-release um, data is that the colder fish tended to see colder waters and fish that were in the, um, fish that were a little bit warmer and less exposed or not exposed as long tended to seek deeper water. Um, and I might just add here that um, when the lake freezes, there's a colder water on the top and then it gets warmer on the bottom. Um, and then these fish that selected the cooler, shallower water tended to have more movement and the fish that selected deep water tended to have less movement. And so what we can conclude from this is like, it's probably better to use a shelter um, to help avoid the block in wind and the cold temperature. It's still a little bit warmer in the shelters. Um, if you can't fish in a shelter, you're better off not exposing these fish to the cold temperatures. And this goes beyond just ice fishing. Um, we also have periods where it's sub-freezing, but it's not quite ice yet, so it's another way to do it. And then we also use this technique to look at different ice fishing handling practices. Um, next, we looked at bass tournaments, black bass tournaments, which are super popular in North America. Um, these events uh, bring hundreds of boats together where they go out onto these lakes and spend all day trying to catch their five biggest fish. They place them into a live well and then they bring them back to a central weigh-in location. Uh, but recently they've come up with this new method to weigh the fish immediately and release it at the spot of capture. So we really wanted to see how that might influence uh, the fish post-release. And so what we did for this is we angled for largemouth and smallmouth bass uh, we attached the bio loggers to them using the Velcro strap again. And we had a control fish that we caught and immediately released. And then we had the catch weigh format where we caught it, weighed it, and then released it immediately at the spot of capture. We also had other fish that we caught, placed in the live wells, and mimicked two different types of weigh-ins, which was a dry weigh-in and a wet weigh-in. And we monitored them for another um, 10 minutes post-release. What we found here is that fish that were placed in the live well tended to seek shallower and warmer water uh, compared to fish that were caught and immediately released, which selected the deeper, cooler water. And we found that these fish in the, the shallower water 
uh, tended to have more movement, and so these are the fish that were placed in the live well, whereas the fish that were caught and immediately released tended to seek the, the deeper, cooler water. Um, and so recommend that the that Moore's series adopt this catch and release, release weigh-in format where, um, especially in spawning seasons, where a lot of anglers tend to pull fish from their beds and bring them to one central weigh-in location. Um, and if they're going to do the central weigh-in locations, they should consider putting it to a deeper, cooler water where there's more structure. And so further on this way in, out of, or, uh, live well stuff is that anglers are starting to use this live well additive, which is a chemical that they put in the water to help recover the fish. And so we wanted to see if this is actually working or not. And so what we did is we caught largemouth bass, we placed them into the live well with either lake water as a control or with these live well additives. Um, we also had a subsample of fish that we used um, for blood sampling, and then we attached to the biologger using the candy method um, and let them swim. We got about five minute uh, monitoring period for these guys. And what we found here is that fish that spent longer in the live well had greater post-release uh, movement, and fish that were in the live wells with the additives also had greater post-release movement. And so this might be showing that these live wells could be acting to help recover these fish a little bit when they're spending time in that live well. And so another thing that we can do with these is look at how, um, answer questions for, for people or guides that are looking to understand what's the best way that these fish could be handled, especially trophy uh, fish. And so I had the pleasure to go up to Northern Ontario and see how different landing methods um, see how different landing methods could be used across a, a size range of fish. And so what we did is we angled for northern pike and um, we recorded the fight time, the handling time, and the unhooking time. And we also caught them with various, or landed them with various methods using a net, grabbing them by hand, or using a cradle. We measured their size and we attached the, a bio-logging package using the, the CACUT suture at a five aught, at size five aught, and we got 12 hours of monitoring from this. What we found here is that larger fish um, tended to have longer fight times and greater handling times. Um, and then fish that were landed by hand also had longer fight times, but they tended to have a lot less of a handling time compared to fish that were landed by the cradle or with the net. And so when we look at the post-release activity, um, we could see that fish landed with the net tended to have greater post-release movement um, followed by fish landed with the cradle, and then fish landed by hand tended to have uh, less locomotory activity in general. And we consider the interaction with size here. Um, we can see that fish landed, it's the blue line that uh, fish landed with the net um, at the smaller size range, tended to have less post-release locomotor activity um, compared to fish with the hand, which is the green line. Um, and as that as the fish got bigger um, and you landed them by hand, they tended to show a little bit more exhaustion and you could see that as they had uh, less post-release locomotor activity. And so the take home message from this is use a net for fish that are over 30 inches or 75 centimeters and fish that are under that 75 centimeter range, you could use your hand. Um, and there's probably a trade off between handling time and fight time here. And so just some final thoughts here is the Velcro method is awesome to use in high risk environments, so ice covered lakes. Uh, the candy method can use for a short term period for maybe you know, up to an hour. Um, and the cat gut suture method is excellent for a longer monitoring period. Um, and you know, the next, next steps here would be to use a greater suture size and try and get longer periods, maybe up to two to three weeks of the biologger being on the fish and might consider adding a GPS to these packages for future work. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent talk, uh, Luke. I, quite informative. Interestingly, uh, the candy that you use here in Australia we call a lifesaver, and uh, there's a bit of irony in that that you're using that data to uh, improve the life of a fish that's released. My other, only other comment is I, I'm still going on... Um, expeditions with Ben Deagles after seeing some of those photos in the ice there. 
Okay, next up we have uh, Caitlin Zinn on some more Chinook talking. Hello everyone. Uh, so I'll be following up on this uh, holding study I talked about this morning, but focusing on our tagging work. Uh, my name is Katie, I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia. I work with Dr. Scott Hinch um, in the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Lab. And um, the title of this, of this talk is about uh, part of my thesis, but I'll be starting with just broadly what the catch and release group in our lab does and kind of show you just what our general methods look like. All right, so first I'd like to talk about uh, fisheries-related incidental mortality. Uh, this is a document that came out in 2017 from our uh, governing body, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, it fo it's focused on where we need to improve our understanding of FRIM. Um, Fisheries-related incidental mortality uh, it's composed of mortality that occurs prior to capture, um, mortality that can occur during handling, and post-release. So knowledge gaps include sublethal effects, cum cumulative impacts, disease, and scoring of the relative mortality risk associated with different risk factors. Lacking are good estimates of post-release mortality and science to improve release survival. So this is kind of guiding where our lab is focusing right now. So we got funding from the BC Salmon Restoration Innovation Fund to enhance the sustainability of captured and released marine recreational Pacific salmon fisheries using new tools and novel technologies. So this work is uh, being done by three PhD students. One is Steve Johnston. He uh, tags Chinook mid-marine mid migration. Um, I'm one of the other ones. I also study Chinook. I study um, catch and release in the ocean, but what's different about what I do is that I follow them from the ocean up to their spawning grounds in fresh water, which hasn't really been done before. And then the third student is Emma Cook, who works on coho, um, more mid-migration as well. So what we're aiming to do is generate measures of post-release mortality, provide validation of current and new fishing methods to enhance survival, examine sublethal infectious agent and cumulative effects, and lastly, produce a science-based best practices guidebook, uh, something that's publicly available, easy to digest, um, and out there to be used, because we don't have a great resource like that currently in BC. So this is what we do. We catch fish, uh, mimicking the wreck fishery. We land them in multiple ways. We land them in a net. Uh, we also land them in a trough for boat side treatments, where we don't want the fish to touch a net. Uh, we also work with multiple partners. Uh, we often have multiple boats fishing at one time. Get them to the processing boat, and then we bring them into our onboard sling. This is one treatment where we bring them with the net on board. Um, we also will air expose the fish sometimes as a treatment. So kind of mimicking someone bringing their own fish onto their boat and then um, you know, deciding what to do with it, letting it go. Uh, this is my colleague Brian working the fish up. He's looking at uh, any reflexes. He's looking for where specifically the hook wound in is, how severe it is. Uh, is there any eye damage? Um, is there a bleed? He'll, look, he'll do a length and a girth. And then we look for other things like scale loss, um, fin damage. He's using an energy probe here to look at the relative fat content of the fish. This is give us clues of how far the fish has to migrate still. Um, we tag our fish with acoustic tags. We do it backpack style behind the dorsal fin with a spaghetti tag to anchor it to the fish. And then we set that down with a crimp. Um, we've pit tagged fish and to look at um, tag retention and it's almost 100%. We take scale samples. Uh, this is for aging and potential genetic stock ID if we lose our fin clip, uh, which you can see Brian taking here. So it allows us to know which river the fish came from and it's going home to. And then we take a gill biopsy for uh, infectious agent and genomic analysis. And then at that point, the fish is ready to go and put back into the ocean, see what its journey is. Um, so those are pretty similar methods for what all of our projects use. So coming back to my stuff now, my specific questions or um, what's overarching in my thesis here are what are the effects of recreational catch and release on Chinook 
And how do these effects carry over into freshwater environment during spawning migrations? I'm also looking at how do cumulative effects of stress from a catch release event, high temperatures, and infectious agents affect Chinook. Um, it's really important to start considering these other factors because as we know, it's not as simple as you know, touching the fish just less. There's also all these other metrics that can affect them. So it's included to incorporate them all in our models. All right, so I work off the west coast of Canada in beautiful British Columbia. Uh, specifically, I work on Vancouver Island. I work in a community called Banfield, which is in Barclay Sound here in the uh, red box. And we work at Banfield Marine Sciences Center, which is a research institute that we are a partner university with. And we're really lucky to work here because we can catch fish off our doorstep ultimately and from May through September, and they have really nice cold water temperatures there. All right, so now I'll kind of show you the tagging work that I do in my system. We're zoomed in on, onto Barclay Sound here. Um, in the light red, you can see this is where we're tagging. And then if you, I don't think I have a laser pointer. If you follow up the river there, or up, up the inlet and up to the river, uh, up to Robertson Creek Hatchery, that is kind of the route that I'm tracking the fish on. Um, I'm aiming for a fish from that stock, and in the past, about 85% of the fish I've tagged have been heading that way. So I used three different tag types. Uh, looking back at 21, I tagged 282 Chinook. 128 of them had eye buttons, which are little temperature loggers. Uh, they're not waterproof, so we plasti dip them and then just add them um, on that spaghetti strap you can see off the back there, kind of how I uh, applied the acoustic tag. We also do acoustic tags. You can see with the red dots here where my acoustic receivers were deployed. Um, one at the entrance of the inlet, midway, and then much more dense from the ocean into the freshwater migration. So I can see how temperature affects their uh, movement in and out of the river, and then up to the hatchery as well. Uh, another bonus of the system is that there's a um, waterfall. Um, it's passable, but a lot of fish take a fishway and that fishway is lined with a pit array, so I can attach a pit tag to every tag as well, so we can see um, how many fish are making it to there and also ensure that fish are being picked up by both pit tags and acoustic tags, so look at our efficiencies as well. And then this last summer, I was doing my holding study uh, that I talked about this morning, so I only tagged 150, but these were really fancy fish because they got all three tag types. So any tag I got back, I got a whole lot of information from because not only did I get temperature, but I also got the movement data. So I could pair those together, um, and I'm really looking forward to digging into that more. So for our treatments, uh, just in general, you know, we've looked at things like hook size, hook type, gear type, um, but today I'm just going to focus on landing. Um, so our first is kind of our control fish. It's our least touched fish. It's landed into the sling, like I showed in the video. It doesn't have any air exposure, and then it's tagged over the side of the boat like that. The next one is the fish is landed in the net, but it's not lifted over to the side of the boat. It's just landed in the net and then put into this boat side sling. So it's um, exposing the fish to the net, but it's not air exposing it. And then the last one is net and air exposure. Then it's tagged in the onboard sling. Um, so this mimics an angler netting a fish, bringing it on board. Uh, we track how long it takes us to take out the hooks. We try and make it realistic. Um, you know, it mimics someone, what, what kind of fish is this? Oh, I don't know. Uh, talk to this buddy. Hey, I don't know. Um, is this the right size? So we're just trying to make it realistic with the fishery. Um, yeah, so those are our three kind of treatments that we thought would be most applicable for providing recommendations. All right, so I want to show you the thermal experience for one of my fish. That, what you're looking at here is the eye button data from fish 87. Uh, you can see the date, bottom left corner, August, on the right, September. So this is showing right when the fish is released to the water uh, through its freshwater migration. And then I actually found this individual up at the hatchery. So it made it all the way to the end. Um, before I break it down, I'd like to show you these temperature thresholds. Um, above 18 degrees, Pacific salmon are stressed. They don't like being in water above 18 degrees, but they can handle it. Above 18 degrees, uh, between 20 and 22, if they're in that range of water temperatures for extended periods, um, it can cause mortality. And then lastly, if Chinook salmon are exposed to temperatures above 22 degrees, um, it can cause mortality very quickly. Uh, and just looking at this, you can see a lot of this fish's migration is in these uh, two lighter red bands. Um, and 
it's from the fish's transition from the ocean to the fresh water that's really stressful. And then in the fresh water, when it's trying to make its way up the river, um, past, you know, hard to swim through areas and at the same time just trying to get there before it, it dies, trying to spawn in time. So there's, these temperatures make it a lot harder for them and it's important to understand what's going on. Okay, so this black dot here shows where the fish enters fresh water. Um, you can see that the pattern goes from like very sporadic to more of a diurnal pattern. Um, I'm excited to actually break down the first 12 and 24 hours post-release because you can see the fish are doing some really, really interesting things. Most fish have that pattern, so you know, excited to look at that as we go forward. So that's what I call the marine segment there um, before it hits freshwater. Looking forward, these two turquoise dots are when the fish was uh, detected on my pit tag array. Um, so you can see here, August 30th, the fish hits the pit array, but it, it must have fallen down the river because it comes back again a week later. So that's the lower river migration. Um, then after that, we know it's in the upper river, and then I got it at the hatchery on uh, September 20th. And you can see the big dip in the water temperature, temperature here. It, um, there's a small lake in the area, and it must have found refuge deep down. So really interesting, just from one eye button, from one fish, what you can learn from it. And then when you pair that with the tagging data as well. So I'm really looking forward to um, analyzing this further and seeing what patterns there are when we relate it back to the um, angling factors as well. But just, you know, in general, away from fishing, this is just important stuff to understand further with all water warming up as well, because it could be very detrimental for all fish. All right, so quickly here, uh, just showing what some fish at capture and at spawning grounds look like. This is one individual. This hasn't really been done before, so I find it really interesting, just having the exact same fish in your hands and seeing how individual condition um, can go, go between 49 days. I'll show a couple. Here's another one, pretty pristine in the ocean and looks quite similar in fresh water. 56 days later, and I also have, you know, gill clip from the boat, gill clip from fresh water. I have a lot of data I can work with here to kind of pick apart what's happening on the physiological level. And then here's another individual. Uh, we've found that fish that have their uh, fins split from the net, those fins don't heal, uh, which is why uh, we're going to be focusing on nets more so this year in my holding study. Right, so. Uh, some findings across all projects, including what Steve and Emma have done just in our group. Uh, smaller hooks increase survival. Oops, fish should be handled as little as possible. Um, you know, if it's a small fish, you can gaff release it. You don't need to put it in the net. That does take skill, though, to do it well. So, you know, this, this is the learning piece that we talk about. Um, size matters. The bigger you are, the better chance you have post-release. Trouble hooks should be avoided and not allowed in our fishery, DFO. Um, and lastly, exposure to warm water temperatures may decrease survival um, on a physiological level. It can increase vulnerability to pathogens and just feeds back into those cumulative effects. So with that, that's the end. And uh, feel free to find me if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so as I sort of mentioned before, our next presenter has, I believe, called in sick, probably COVID, who knows, um, which is disappointing because it was about a, um, a chartered saltwater fly fishery in Queensland. So there would have been some great photos and lots to learn from. So what we might do with that in mind is I think we might start our um, panel question and answer uh, straight away if, you, if our panellists would like to come up and have a seat. There are only three, so should be able to target a few questions. I'm also going to run around with a microphone, so I'll. Uh, oh, down. You can do that. No worries. Grab that one. Oh, he's gone. Have we lost Ben? Have we? Ben Diggles has done a run up. Well, that's okay. He's just going to tell us more about his trip to Queensland fishing, so I'm happy to, to leave that. Any, any questions to start us off? Yorick. Yeah, g'day. I'm uh, Yorick. I'm one of the directors of the Victorian Fisheries Authority. Um, we've had quite a number of conversations around, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, fish care and, and ethics and, and some of the challenges that we see coming down the line. Uh, 
In terms of social licence, so we're very interested in um, what we could do to encourage uh, our recreational fishers to to improve fish care and improve outcomes for fish and to be able to demonstrate that. I think um, both the keynote this morning and, and your talk now has talked about the importance of being able to communicate that effectively. And as you do in Canada, we've got multiple types of fish, uh, multiple species uh, that have been targeted, all with different characteristics, salt, salt water, fresh water. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on how easy it would be to distill a message down that, that was a, gen, a general message that you could particularly target to say new anglers, you know, kids, um, that, that is applicable to all all species, as opposed to trying to come up with a whole bunch of species specific messaging. We have had a, a care for cod campaign for our iconic Murray cod, which was very popular with school kids, but it's limited, I think, in its scope. So, uh, and I saw keep fish, keeping fish wet is obviously one very simple message, but but do you think there's maybe you know? three or four key things that could have a significant impact that we could start to impart to, to recreational anglers uh, in Australia and around the world? That's a very detailed question there, Yorick. <laughs> Who would like to start? Oh, I think it really starts at the tackle shop. Everyone buys their stuff at the tackle shop and like, I spent a few years of my life working in the tackle industry now and selling gear to anglers and that's the first step before they hit the water. And so I think that's one of the, the key spots that you can get that message across before they even start casting the line. Like, that's really where you can get information across quick. Yeah, yeah and just to build off that, um, to buy a fishing license in Canada, you hit yes and pay $20. What about answering a couple questions? Um, that right there is to fish, you have to have a license, so that's one mandatory place people have to go. Um, or even just, you know, flip through a page where there's this really easy to digest information with photos and, you know, not scaring people away. Um, yeah, but there, I think there is a need, at least in British Columbia, like people, I mean, all anglers care about their local area, but the marine fishery that we have, people want to help, but the, 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 the DFO website for our government is just so hard to navigate and it really scares people away. So just having some easy resource I think will, will help, but I agree it's complex and a little frustrating at times for sure because we just want to all help. Yep. I'm going to add on that quick. Um, like Caitlin was talking about with um, getting the license. Um, I think there, it'd be beneficial if there was definitely like a quiz or a tutorial that you have to go through. Um, similar to in Canada, you have to go through a, a hunting course to get your hunting license. It might deter some people from getting the actual fishing license, but um, overall I think it'd be beneficial for giving like an educational campaign prior to actually being able to go catch these fish and handle them. Excellent. Uh, over there, Modi? I think Steve's got a question. You might want to. G'day, I'm Steve. I'm a avid recreational fisher and diver. I noticed in one of your presentations the treble hooks, um, having made mention to no treble hooks. Is that regulation for you guys that you don't use trebles? I don't use trebles here. Um, every lure I buy, straight off at the treble and put a single hook on, generally flatten the barbs out myself. Over the years of fishing, having seen the damage the trebles do, not only to the fish, but to your nets, your gear, and you know, personal injury, um, I think you know, treble hooks are probably something that you know, I'd advocate for not, not seeing recreationally. Um, you guys, is it regulation? Yeah, so in, in freshwater, you're not allowed to use trebles in rivers. Some lakes you can. Um, in the ocean, some areas are single barbless only, um, but some areas where catch and release is allowed, there are treble hooks allowed for salmon, not barbed, but some areas it's allowed. Um, in Washington State, pretty much the same fishery right below us, they're not allowed to use trebles, and if you're not keeping a fish, you can't bring it over the gunnel of your boat. Um, Canada doesn't have either of those laws, so yeah, trebles are allowed. Um, yeah, I, I did a study where we just simply compared trebles versus single hooks and survival was significantly lower with treble hooks for all That's sizes of Chinook. That would have been my next question. Did you yeah, look at the mortality rate, trebles to no trebles? So that's yeah, good to know. Thanks. 
Uh, and welcome, Ben. Uh, we, we, that's okay. No, no, we, uh, we know you were rushing back, but we had a cancellation uh, yeah, of an extra person, so we, we did start a bit early. It's not, it's not, your, uh, not your fault. Um, and I think uh, um, Russell Conway over there, he'd be a big advocate for uh, no more trebles, wouldn't you, Russell? I remember you seemed to see you get one dug out of your hand at one stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the jungle. wasn't much fun. Uh, I think from I couldn't watch my point of view as I mentioned way back in 1996 our first study we we looked at that extent even though we had low actual mortality rates all the all the data points to these trebles just being damaging more fish increasing your your time interval out of the water trying to dehook them all and barbs are even worse and I think it would be uh, a great move if, if the movers and shakers in the recreational fishing industry or even some tackle manufacturers stood up and said, well, that's enough. We actually, we're not going to produce these things anymore. Because half the time they don't actually, when you look at hook theory, how fishing hook works, they don't hook fish properly anyway uh, because the, you know, the, the, th the three points actually work against each other. So you tend to be more jagging the fish rather than actually hooking it. And then all the other baggage with the, uh, with the trebles. I hate them and I don't really have them on my boat, to be honest. There's specific reasons I will use a treble and only in specific circumstances. Otherwise, they just don't have them. So you're not a fan of the, uh, the latest invention coming out of the Japanese tackle show with a, a new style of treble, which oh, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll nickname the Shredder? <laughs> oh, right, OK. Um, no, I don't know what that looks like, but... Um, it doesn't sound real flash. In the uh, the holding study I was talking about, I we took you know detailed measurements of you know how many fish are we losing, all that kind of stuff, and we lost way more fish on troubles. So that in itself is an issue too if you're injuring more fish and letting letting them fall off because people say oh they're fine, it's fine, you know. So I have data on that too. Any further questions? Uh, well, it's a bit of thinking time. I've got one. So um, you, something I picked up from both presentations uh, was, was around the thermal tolerance of fish. And, um, and, and I guess if we bring that to some of our Australian salmonid fisheries, we have quite warm summers here, as you're in, you're in one at the moment. Um, and, um, and so we... How do I frame it as a question? We tend to see bigger fish get caught in warmer water. Um, and I'm wondering if, this, uh, if you've done any real work around size of fish and thermal tolerances and, and how that... Uh, is that have an impact on their, on their release? So, i.e. catching a smaller fish in water warmer versus a larger fish, does that impact on your studies at all? Yeah, I, I definitely need to look at, you know, exposure to temperature versus size. But in, in that other holding study, I did have um, a group of fish, I just didn't have time to talk about it, um, that were exposed. We had a really warm surface water blob come in, in in July, which was pretty early, and we weren't pumping from below the thermocline to fill the onboard boat yet. So that gr some of those fish were exposed to temperatures up to, I think, 17 degrees. And some of those fish uh, developed an infection really quickly, and those were all the smaller fish. Um, so there might be something there. I just yeah. haven't dug into it yet. No, it's interesting. Yeah, we, we certainly catch trout in you know, 26, 27 degree water, um, which is that more, above that mortality line, but they, they, they do not release. Um, but it, yeah, the theory is they come out of the cold water into the warm water feed, then go back to the cold water, so they're able to handle that temperature a bit better. Uh, I did have another question, but I can't remember it. it was... Yep. Uh, this is a question for, for Ben and the the S factor that you that you created. Has that been shown to be very successful? So I think you you made it about 15 years ago. Has it changed? Has that formula changed over that period of time? Has there been any sort of tweaking to it? Have you found better ingredients to put inside these fish? And I suppose it also 
transposes to the other two speakers in your in, in Canada, do you use that sort of same type of um, sense when you're trying to when, when recreational fishers are trying to catch fish? There's probably two different questions there. But the first one was no, they they actually haven't asked for a change there. Um, but on one hand, these attractants, they uh, the modern scientifically developed ones, they actually do work. They they activate. Uh, olfactory gustatory um, uh, receptors on the fish. So you're basically pushing the fish's buttons and getting them to, to react differently to your lure. Uh, and that works both ways. So in a, in a population of fish which aren't exposed to these attractants, they work really, really well. But once everyone starts using them, uh, it can work the opposite way because if you're doing a lot of catch and release, uh, you get an immediate... Uh, uh, a aversion to something they can remember and something that's very hardwired into that uh, actual um, predatory process is the olfactory and gustatory uh, stimuli that they remember for next time. So um, one of the things is using them in, in tournaments, for example. Uh, it's the behaviour of the tournament fishermen tell you what's going on. If, if someone has a product that the others can't get a hold of, it's it's just a, a clamour for them to get a hold of the, that, that new thing. So I think um, some of the manufacturers may be modifying formulas over time, but that's not something that's been, that's been done here. So that second question was... What was your second? Yeah, over. Yeah, there's some attractants in Canada. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that are looking at them right now. There were some studies done in the early 2000s on um, power bait on trout fisheries. And uh, yeah, they, they were basically an artificial bait. Uh, Ron Cocking. Um, I was fishing in one of our lakes at Dartmouth in Victoria and I had two, um, a spinner on and when I, I got it hooked and the hook actually broke off the, the spinner and it was stainless steel. Now I imagine that wouldn't deteriorate very quick and I wonder what the difference in the composition is. Do you ever look at, look at like um, stainless steel, metal ones, galvanised ones? Because I've lo in the last two years, I've lost two lures because the fish have actually taken their lure and the hook's actually broken off. It sometimes happens because a lot of people make lures these days in their backyards. And in Australia, there's a lot of them. And they, they're all good. They're not doing anything wrong. But they don't last as long as some of the others. And I, I just wonder if the composition of the hooks has ever been looked into. Because when I was younger, and I'm going back in the 50s, um, it was little metal hooks and they bent and everything, but uh, they've just deteriorated. Uh, if you left them in your tackle box, if they got wet or anything like that. Today it's mainly stainless steel and they don't seem to break down very easy. Essentially, the biodegradable hook is some of those ones that corrode. Have you guys had any? There was some work done on black brim. I think Daniel Grixty did some work on, on that. Um, from memory, I can't e exactly remember the, the outcomes, but what I have seen um, from... I dissect a lot of fish in my job as a fish pathologist in many places. And in areas where we, we see sort of increasing or high wreck fishing pressure, there's um, a lot of times I will be dissecting fish which have hooks in them, or evidence of recent hooking, and uh, it looked like the, the hooks that do, do rust actually do tend to be processed by the fish, uh, either internally uh, a bit slower. There was some queen fish, for example, I dissected in Darwin Harbour that had hooks in them that were nearly completely rusted out and almost resolved, deep hooking, gut hooking situation, which had almost been resolved purely because the hooks were... Um, uh, essentially biodegrading in there. 
Now, on the other hand, a stainless hook wouldn't do that. So they, I think there is some literature that suggests the stainless hooks are more likely to, to be lodged for a longer period because you aren't having that sort of degradation aspect of it. Uh, that's on the pro side. On the con side is a, if you were um, a doctor needed to do some surgery on you, would you like him to, to roll up with that beautiful, clean, stainless steel scalpel or would you like him to come up with an old, rusty one? And, and cut you open. So there's, uh, there's I guess, potential for um, a potential issue with metals poisoning or something like that uh, for a given size hook for a given size fish if you go down the route of having um, uh, like a hook that might degrade uh, more frequently, like more uh, faster. Um, so I, I think there may be some literature on that, but I can't remember off the top of my head what the outcomes are. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, there's not much stainless steel stuff on my boat. I, I use uh, hooks that I know will corrode away and um, I just change them more frequently. And, and just I one last question too, Ben. Just with the um, that depth that the, the hooks went into the fish with obviously the bait and then the um, attractor and then the just the plain hard-bodied lures, yep. it, do, you, do you think that's some sort of once the, the, the hook meets the fish's mouth, like it's more convinced it's food in those two former ones and, and there's something that says, hold on, this isn't food, if it's just a hard-bodied lure, which makes it less likely to ingest it? Okay. Well, there's a decision process that fish... Uh, the fishing is, is trying to convince the fish to put its mouth on your presentation. So that's actually a decision process the fish decides and, it, and whether they're going to eat it or not is actually usually very late in the process. Uh, the attractants only work in a, at a very uh, sh short um, range, I guess. Uh, so there's, uh, you've got visual stimulus, depends on the, the water clarity. You can, might be an attractive fish from 20 metres away and in 20 metres of water vis. Um, uh, sort of the olfactory, the, the smell uh, can, can trigger fish from a a quite a long distance away and they can follow chemical trails up in the water. But when it comes time to approaching a lure and then convincing the fish that that's something that's actually edible, that's where the, the attractant actually becomes important because there is, and we saw that with the, um, those stripey, the, the Janet in our data there, where we had this quite a big jump up in fish uh, in, in hooking depth, which was essentially reduction of fowl hooking is what that, um, that data set uh, uh, when we, and we explain that, we have to read the, the paper. That's explained in the paper. So I encourage everyone to actually go and get the paper itself because we obviously go into it more depth than we can here. But it, that stripey, and it, was, it reacts different to the, the, the surrounded, the cod, they've got those big eyes and the big mouth and, and they're coming up and swallowing things and then deciding what to do with it afterwards. That's what it looked like. But those... Um, the uh, Lejanid, it looked like uh, for the hard-bodied lure without an attractant, they would, a lot of the time it might have even been a territorial swipe to tell it to go away. It didn't look like, uh, you know, a proportion of those fish weren't actually trying to eat it and therefore you get a foul hooking situation which rates very low on our scale. Uh, you put the attractant on it then immediately this big jump up, they're actually trying to eat it. So it seems that it would obviously vary between the ecology of the different fish Probably also in, in that data set, because we, we caught thousands of fish on that reef flat over many years, and there's other things that come into it, including the, the, the wind direction and speed, which affects our drift. We're drifting across the flat, which affects your presentation. Uh, water depth a little bit with tide. We can only fish the top part of the tide. So there's a whole range of other variables in there but uh, we, we got a very good feel over time that that attractant was affecting that last minute decision, especially of things like that, uh, that stripey, to whether that, that object was food or just something that they can tell them you know, to piss off. Thanks, Thanks very much. Um, just some recurring themes coming out of the presentation there. Uh, uh, you know, if we just generalise, you know, trebles versus singles and barb versus non-barb in terms of fish welfare. Um, a question earlier on recognising, you know, that, that um, it's well, 
Well known in, in recreational fishing circles, uh, highly engaged recreational fishing circles about how those sorts of practices and hook choices can uh, um, affect the, the fish's ongoing survival. Um, how, how much work is being done, I guess, in translating this information in an immediate sense in a species by species sense? I, I guess some of the specific fisheries in North America there. Are you aware of any of those um, those things, or are you very much relying upon, you know, the Keep Fish Wet and other organisations to do, do their job and for it to, uh, to to trickle out as it has been for some time? Back in uh, at home in Ontario, Canada, there's a few reg regulations in the trout streams. Um, it's a single barbless hook, um, but a single barbless hook means a treble hook as well. Um, so that's one regulation they have. So I think maybe making that a little bit clearer to a single barbless hook, sorry, not a single barbless hook, but like a more of a J hook rather than a treble hook and using maybe using the words of like taking treble hooks off or something like that would be good. That sounded effectively like, sound like the anglers were finding a loophole in the wording of the legislation there when they said single barbless hook, because the intent may well have been to have a single barbless J hook, but because they didn't actually spell it out. Yeah. Uh, a treble hook is also a single by itself, one, just one hook. And probably more so for the social scientists here too is kind of the motivations behind, you know, that, that sort of level of interpretation when there is so much general knowledge out there. Uh, you know, what are the drivers behind fishers retaining a treble hook or a, or a barbed hook when there's so much good knowledge out there uh, about fish survival as well? Yeah. yeah, we're finding in BC that a lot of people, especially, you know, a lot of the guiding community does want specific species information, um, especially in our marine fishery. It's, it's a, you know, a, a troll fishery, so not people can easily say that doesn't apply here because it's just a different a different action. So I think in some cases, um, more people will be convinced with a specific study for their species. Um, but I think having those overarching guiding principles for everything is really important to have too. Yeah, I've got a question that I guess I could ask to Luke later, but I just can't wait. Uh, <laughs> um, the the slide about the pike um, handled with a net versus by hand, um, if I remember correctly, the larger the fish got, the more, um, the better state they were in post-release if uh, I think they were handled by hand and the smaller ones were better off handled by net afterward. Is that correct? Other way around. Other way around. Yeah. Yes. Right, right, okay. And what do you, I was curious what you attributed that to, and if you'd expect that to hold across species, like a lake trout of similar size, you know, do you have any reason to believe either way? Yeah, I think that would hold across um, all species, to be honest with you, um, or larger species like the lake trout or the pike or the muskies, uh, the bigger predatory fish, mostly because using the net, you're reducing your fight time. And so I think there's like a spot between a handling time and your fight time that you gotta, you gotta find with all species. And I'm sure you could start putting thresholds on numbers for size when you should be using a net versus getting them by hand. Um, yeah, but I think the biggest thing is they're reducing the fight time. But there'd be a caveat on that though, wouldn't there? Because there's some nets that I wouldn't go near any fish with. So there has to be a net design. To, to, before you put guidelines up like that, uh, you really do have to have a caveat about net design and material because um, splitting all the fins, especially if you've got tenacity baculum or any of those external uh, you know, secondary infection uh, agents, which are always out there, the ubiquitous in the environment, the vibrios and the tenacity baculums, they infect those as much as you might like to think, oh, we, the fins were a bit split, but it'll be okay. Uh, if you ever take those fish into captivity for any length of time, it, it almost invariably gets infected. So avoiding, uh, personally, I hate landing nets and I don't use them at all. One 
good reason to use them would be to minimise fight time, but it would have to be the correct landing net. And the, the other thing is that they, they do support the fish's body if it's the right size. And for a metre plus muskie, it'd have to be a pretty impressive looking net for it to actually do the job properly. So it is a very big balancing act you're talking about here because the, one of the biggest organs on a fish, um, surface area wise, is the slime coat or the epithelium on the outside and you're messing with that directly. Um, so in a lot of those situations, a, a well applied set of boga grips handling those big fish on the side of the boat is very, actually very effective, uh, like as a form of a temporary tether to be able to get the fish under control. While the landing net, you're almost invariably, yeah, we're bringing this fish in the boat, which is then you're, you're balancing your air exposure time as well. If we are talking about catch and release, um, if you're taking him home to, to eat, none of that matters. It's all about just bang him on the head as quick as possible. So if we're talking about catch and release, and all those other factors need to come into it. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, there's a few things you can think about there. Um, so the study that generated this question of using a net versus landing the fish by hand was specific to Northern Pike at a lodge where you have a lot of novice anglers um, and one guy that takes out the group. And so these people are catching trophy fish and people are most definitely gonna want a picture with it. And so when you start adding a bunch of different things together, you know, you got your fight time, uh, Northern Pike have like some sharp teeth you're generally using lures with fairly large treble hooks. So getting that fish under control at the side of the boat might take, it's gonna take a lot longer. Um, whereas you could scoop it with the net, um, unhook it, and that fish is still in the net while everything, the mayhem in the boat is going on. Um, you get your camera ready, you get your unhooking tools ready. Whereas if you're catching it, if you're landing that by hand, that fish is now in the boat flopping on the ground and you know, now it's air exposed. So, and then back to that net thing, um, you know, there's definitely definitely some, some stuff to be done there. There's enough studies that look at the nets and different type of nets to use. Um, we used a, a, a one single rubber net, um, or I guess rubber coated net, and yeah, that's what we used. From the point of view of that, then those rubber coated nets are certainly better than the old nylon knotted things. Um, so that's sort of fortunate in a way. In Australia, a bloke called Dave Irvine developed what was called an Enviro net, which was essentially um, uh, a knotless, very fine uh, net that almost looked like mosquito meshing, but quite heavy duty. It's uh, quite useful for, for up to very large fish. Um, but again, you have limitations on the mesh size. It was, it was designed so that it didn't actually catch uh, fins and split them. And so there are uh, aspects of landing net design that could well be looked at much more closely by the industry to improve these aspects of that process. Because I agree entirely with what you're saying about these other benefits of being able to support the fish properly, bring it in the boat, and net does that very well. Uh, and then getting the... the uh, the lure out and getting it ready for the um, uh, for the photograph. So that what we're talking is a balancing act, aren't we? Correct. But if you use the wrong net, then what you're saving there, you're losing somewhere else. Yeah, I guess I guess in those fisheries, you also have the luxury of being quite close to the water. Um, when we're out fishing in big swells, we have to also clear this the big side of the boat um, and lift the fish a lot higher and longer and net weight is really important for us because the bag that we use is so big and we've we've used you know a couple different we haven't done it specifically as a treatment yet but we've used you know knotless and release nets and we tried the rubber coated ones that had pretty big mesh size and they were almost worse because they could like still get on the fins but they sliced them just faster there's less abrasion so it seems like the best thing at least in our fisheries the the smaller mesh size rubber coated but the weight of that is like, it's hard to scoop a fish. So it's, it's a delicate balance. Um, yeah, at least in the freshwater fishery, you sometimes have the water to support the fish while it's in the net. Um, yeah, it's not simple. Okay, well, if that's the end of the questions, we might um, wrap up early unless there's anything else. No, nothing else. Well, thank you guys. Really appreciate you. Uh, uh, talks today and um, yeah let's let's call it early
unless anyone's got a problem with it. Thank you.